voices of unknown origin appearing on radio frequencies were first noticed in Scandinavia by the military in the 30s and were put down at the time to secret Nazi transmitters. But the voices spoke in unknown and mixed tongues and after the war no records of secret Nazi transmissions ever came to light. The voices didn't stop after the war but their rapidity and the transient nature precluded study. That is, until the tape recorder came into common usage in the 50s. A group of radio hams in Chicago studied the strange transmissions, male and female voices speaking in polyglot mode and lyrical tones. They were confronted at once with living voices, which answered back. Speech being a mark of intelligence and a highly structured artifact. Voices which were human-like, but exhibiting odd characteristics, like constructing a sentence from the elements of one or more languages, impinging on a regular broadcast, and by a strange process of metamorphosis, twisting the words of the speaker to suit their purposes and messages. The voice you have just heard is that of Raymond Cass, an important figure in the early study of electronic voice phenomenon and parapsychology. Cass is just one of many who have devoted their lives to the pursuit of understanding what is now called electronic voice phenomenon. Electronic voice phenomenon occurs when anomalous voices that weren't heard at the time appear on audio recordings. Voices that some claim to be from the dead. According to a paper in the 2006 proceedings from the Second International Conference on Physical Death, Electronic voice phenomenon has the possibility of carrying out dialogues free of any intermediation by the mind of a medium, and directly observable by everybody present, leading it to become wildly popular in modern times. Starting as early as the 1900s, people have attempted to build devices to speak to the spirit world. Could technology serve as an answer to this strange phenomenon? Channeling the spirit realm using technology is called Instrumental Transcommunication, or ITC. Coined in the 1970s by Ernst Sankowski, a German physicist, ITC is electronically supported contacts with other ranges of human consciousness. This means communicating with the dead through electronic devices, such as radios and TVs. Dr. Annabella Cardoso, who previously worked in the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of Portugal and is the founder of ITCJournal.org, knew Sankowski well and has a wealth of direct experiences. And so it was Professor Sankowski who devised the term instrumental transcommunication. And he, he wanted to cover all types of phenomena, spontaneous computer text, direct radio voices, telephone messages, everything that comes to electronic devices. He wanted to find a term to cover them all. That's how we found the instrumental transcommunication. And it became known as such. ITC is a modern spin on something much older and speaks to some of the core beliefs that make our species unique. For thousands of years, people have tried to lift the veil to speak with the spirit world through mediumship and shamanism. As Sankowski said in his seminal work titled simply, Instrumental Transcommunication, ITC virtually is a complex of psychophysical interplay in which ancient humanistic contents appear in new forms. The language and core beliefs of ITC have clear roots in the spiritualist movement, which gripped the Western world in the late 19th century. It was the belief that mediums could communicate with the afterlife through sounds like rappings and writings dictated to them in trance states. The first account of otherworldly voices being captured on tape is commonly referenced in paranormal literature as coming from American ethnologist Waldemar Borgos, who was studying shamanic rituals in Siberia in the early 1900s. Waldemar Borgos brought a phonograph with him to record the rituals 
and popular accounts say that Borogos ended up recording ghostly voices, not heard at the time. But according to Borogos's journal, his recordings were not spiritual in nature. The following passage comes directly from him. The Chukchi ventriloquists display great skill and could with credit to themselves carry on a contest with the best artist of the kind. The separate voices of their calling come from all sides of the room, changing their place to the complete illusion of the listeners. I tried to make a phonographic record of the separate voices. All these tricks strangely resemble the doings of modern spiritualists, and without any doubt, they cannot be carried out without the help of human assistance. While the story of Borogos's phonographic recordings may have gotten distorted over time, like a decades-old game of telephone, there are many respected and influential figures throughout history who did actually attempt to speak with the dead using technology. In 1918, Nikola Tesla was experimenting with radio technology using electromagnetic waves. He wrote of an unnerving experience, which, while he did not attribute directly to spirits, it would inspire his lifelong rival and competitor, Thomas Edison, to build a spirit phone. Tesla wrote in his diary, The sounds that I am listening to every night at first appear to be human voices conversing back and forth in a language I cannot understand. I find it difficult to imagine that I am actually hearing real voices from people not of this planet. There must be a more simple explanation that has so far eluded me. And there was a simpler explanation. The type of radio Tesla was working with was able to detect very low radio frequencies, such as those coming from electrical storms, household devices, and atmospheric disturbances. This is what produced the unusual noises Tesla heard. Nonetheless, the gauntlet had been thrown, in Edison's mind, and he had to get in on this discovery before Tesla. In an interview with American Magazine in 1920, Edison said the following, I have been at work for some time building an apparatus to see if it is possible for personalities which have left the Earth to communicate with us. I am engaged in the construction of one such apparatus now, and I hope to be able to finish it before very many months pass. I don't claim anything because I don't know anything. For the matter, no human being knows. But I do claim that it is possible to construct an apparatus which will be so delicate that if there are personalities in another existence who wish to get in touch with us, this apparatus will at least give them a better opportunity. While Edison's spirit phone never materialized, a man by the name of George Meek did create a machine that he said could contact the dead. Meek was an engineer who specialized in thermodynamics and was well-respected in his field. His invention was called the Spiritcom, short for spirit communication, and he invested half a million dollars into completing it. George Meek was so confident in his invention that he called a press conference in 1982 at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. to announce his discovery. Good morning. Uh, thanks for coming out. The findings I am announcing today are truly fantastic and far out, but I can assure you that they are pure science, not science fiction. For the first time, we have electronic proof that the mind, memory banks, and personality survive death of the physical body. An elementary start has been made toward the perfection of a communication system that should someday permit those living on Earth to talk with persons very much alive on higher levels of consciousness. The system will use electromagnetic and etheric energies, and it should carry telephone-like conversations, and perhaps someday provide video transmissions. Recordings of George Meek's Spiritcom exist. The following is an actual recording of the device being operated. Now I, I just turned the camera, TV camera on, sir. What did you say? Wait a minute. I said I just turned the TV camera on. You never know, doctor. Yes, I understand, William. All right, now, very well. Now, let's get on with this. And what I suggest, William, is that we disregard <clears throat> this audio project. Audio project? Yes. Communications could only be achieved when one specific man used the machine. His name was William O'Neill, a self-described healer and medium. 
O'Neill would only operate the machine alone, after which he would send videotapes of the recordings to Meek for review. Videos of these communications are available on YouTube, so you can view and judge for yourself. But these facts, coupled with that O'Neill always kept his back to the camera, the spirits in O'Neill never speak at the same time, and that the spirit voices sound amazingly similar to someone operating an electrolarynx, a medical device used to produce clearer speech for those who have lost their voice box, should produce a great deal of skepticism. That and O'Neill was also a trained ventriloquist. It seems Meek, perhaps in good intention, may have been misled by O'Neill, especially considering, in a naive move, he offered to pay O'Neill for each successful communication. The Spiritcom experiment is still pointed to as definitive proof of spirit communication to this day. There's even an app you can download to your phone that makes the grand claim to reproduce the effects of this dubious machine. But it was in 1964 when Frederick Jurgensen, a Swedish singer, artist, and documentary filmmaker, published a book titled Voices from the Universe, which brought electronic voices closer to the mainstream. In it, he details his extensive experiences with anomalous voices on tape recorders. Initially capturing bird noises for a documentary, he noticed strange voices appearing on tape. Voices that were not there while recording. Jurgensen became so singularly focused on understanding their origin and meaning that he pushed many family members and friends away in his 28-year study. What you are about to hear are some samples from Jurgensen's recordings showcasing the electronic voice phenomenon. The voice is apparently speaking in German, and admittedly, it's eerie. Jurgensen made hundreds of recordings like the one you just heard throughout his life. He employed the use of white noise from radios while recording, which he believed aided in the transmission of spirit communication. He had one specific radio frequency which he relied on the most, between 1445 and 1500 kilohertz. In the ITC community, this has been dubbed the Jurgensen frequency. Frederick Jurgensen is commonly referenced as the first person to capture modern day EVP recordings, which actually isn't true. Earlier EVP recordings had already been captured by two experimenters, Attila von Soleil and Raymond Bayliss in 1956. Their findings would later be published in the Journal of the American Society for Psychical Research in 1959, where he had recorded some modest phrases such as, hot dog, this is G, and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you all. Their work is much less known, and unfortunately, Recordings from these early experiments are hard to track down, if not completely lost to time. But it wasn't until 1971 that the idea of capturing the voices of the dead really took hold in the mainstream, when respected Latvian psychologist and pupil of Carl Jung, Konstantin Raudiv, published his book Breakthrough, an amazing experiment in electronic communication with the dead. Konstantin had been inspired by Jurgensen's book, and decided to see if there was any truth to the filmmaker's claims. In the book, he captured six years of methodical research in the field, referencing physicists, psychologists, and theologians as he explored the growing phenomenon and possible sources for the mysterious voices. In Jurgensen's view, there can be no doubt whatsoever that the phenomenon manifesting in Dr. Rowdy's experiments is the same that manifests in my own. The voices describe themselves as the dead, but always stress, most emphatically, that they are very much alive. The dead live, they say. I can state with utmost conviction and certainty, these messages stem without doubt from our so-called dead. The publication of his book was accompanied with a vinyl record which played various examples of some of the voice phenomenon Raudiv had captured. Following are some samples of Raudiv's actual recordings. A request by the experimenter that the voice entities should tell him from where they came. German, land of the soul. A Latvian voice then breaks in. Down, 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 down. 
Latvian. You are burning people. Annabella Cardoso added this about the impact of Raudiv's work. And everybody started experimenting. Many started rece- receiving voices. You, you sit down in a room, studio, wherever you wish, and without interference. So you sit down and you start speaking to communicators or address whoever you want to address. And then you give it, what, something like 10, 15 minutes. You make a question or a comment. Wait one minute or two, then another one, and then you finish your experiment. When when you play back what you recorded, voices might be there. Not always, of course, but many, many times, well, uh, at least it, that's how it happened with me. Of course, the assertion that audio technology can pick up the voices of the dead has been met with fierce skepticism. Mary Roach, American author and skeptic, wrote in her 2005 book Spooked that there is no reason to postulate anything but natural causes, indistinct fragments of radio transmissions, mechanical noises, and unnoticed remarks, aided by imaginative guesswork and wishful thinking to explain the voice phenomenon. We spoke with Diana Deutsch, a leading expert on the psychology of music who has studied and written extensively about musical and linguistic illusions. During her research, she discovered something that she calls the phantom word phenomenon. She believes that EVPs, like the ones captured by Jurgensen and Raudiv, are the result of a natural process occurring in the human mind. I coined the term phantom word to describe an illusion that I experienced on hearing words and phrases that weren't being spoken. And I discovered this illusion by chance. This involves playing repeating sequences of tones to the right and left ears. Since this early illusion involved repeating high and low tones, I recorded the words high and low and played them repeatedly like this, high, low, high, low, high, low, and so on. And as, as I was listening to this pattern, I was surprised to find that I was hearing different words and phrases. For example, no time or diet coke and so on. And I should mention that the words and phrases that are heard, these phantom words and phrases, correspond to what's on the person's mind in a way that's very much like ink plots in a Rorschach test. Recordings to trigger the phantom word illusion are on Diane's website. We'll play a short sample, but to really experience the full effect, it is best to listen for longer. The longer you listen, the more words and phrases seem to leap forth from the otherwise meaningless noise. By the end of that recording, various words may have begun to take shape, illustrating the phantom word phenomenon. A trick our brain plays, not only through experiments like this, but in our everyday life. You're given a word or a phrase um, out there in the real world, and what you hear is something entirely different, and it makes you realize, my God, you know, you know, you, you start asking questions about the relationship between illusion and reality. Um, you know, how much of what we see and hear can we really believe? And I think that it is a big question, and I think that this phantom words phenomenon certainly points very strongly to the fact that we don't really necessarily hear or see things that, that are really out there. But it doesn't mean that they're produced by ghosts or spirits. It just means that our brains are constructively um, trying to create sounds that are meaningful to us. But I would say, I certainly don't believe that they're voices from the spirit world. And here's one thing that one should consider if they think that perhaps I stumbled on um, a, a way of invoking voices from the spirit world, then they would need to explain why it is that if you get a large group of people 
and you play them one phantom word, they all hear different things from each other. So it's not like the spirit, if, if it was a spirit, the spirit would be um, saying the same thing to all the different people. That doesn't work. In response to critics, David Fontana, a British psychologist, parapsychologist, and author, wrote in his book, Is There an Afterlife? The absence of supporting evidence can lead us to reject evidence that may prove worthy of serious study and can deter some independent investigators from informing us of their results. Much scientific progress in the past has come from those prepared to entertain anomalous views and to go by the evidence in front of them rather than by conventional wisdom. And while misinterpretation seems like a plausible explanation for many of the recordings where voices are only noticed after the recording had been made, there is another form of ITC voice recording that is lesser known and stranger still. It is called direct radio voices, or DRV. DRV is when voices are heard and recorded at the same time. These voices come through radios and will directly answer questions or address those present in the room. Annabella Cardoso describes these voices in her book, Electronic Contact with the Dead, What Do the Voices Tell Us?, as much rarer and come directly into the air from the loudspeaker of a radio, usually also in response to questions or comments by the human operator. They may sound robotic and are often distorted, but when they are clear, they may allow for dialogue and the reception of amazing information from the other world, from where the voices proper state they have come. The first direct radio voices were captured in Italy by a man eager to share his experience with others. Marcello Bacci amazes visitors and scientific investigators who say they can hear the dead speaking through his old vacuum tube radio. We wish to know more with respect. This audio was taken from the UFO TV documentary, The Afterlife Investigations. In the world of parapsychology research, the name Marcello Bacci carries weight. Like many others, Marcello became fascinated with electronic voice phenomenon after learning about Jurgensen's experiences in Sweden. He was already a longtime paranormal enthusiast, having frequented mediums all throughout his early life. Along with a close group of friends, Marcello began a journey into electronic spirit communication that would end up defining the rest of his life. In Marcello Bacci's book, he says, We were not driven into the research as a result of dramatic occurrences or painful events, neither by religious convictions or philosophical theories, and even less by scientific principles for which we had to find evidential support. The spring that triggered it all was purely and simply interest in the research. It turns out, Marcello had a talent for capturing spirit voices. He was not only able to capture voices on tape recorders, he was able to speak in real time to the spirit world through the use of radios. Audible voices spoke to Marcello through old vacuum tube radios, with many attendees filling the room to listen in. Traditional EVPs are generally hard to decipher and don't form coherent sentences. But Marcello's recordings were minutes long, with clear, audible voices speaking fully formed sentences through his radio. He'd tune the radio to a shortwave band ranging from 7 to 9 megahertz. After waiting a period of time, the static vanished, and attendees described hearing what sounded like wind coming out of the radio. At this point, Marcello would establish contact with the voices, holding intricate and detailed conversations that would last anywhere from 3 to 4 minutes. Unlike the traditional EVP recordings, which are a one-way conversation, Marcello and audience members were able to ask questions and get responses in real time. After contact was finished, attendees reported hearing what sounded to some like a choir or singing before the usual radio static returned and the voices were no more. Here is an actual recording from one of Marcello's sessions demonstrating the choir noises attendees reported hearing. One of the incredible things about Marcello's experiments was that he would conduct them in front of large groups, sometimes up to 70 people at once. Many of the attendees were those who had lost loved ones, hoping to have one final contact with their dearly departed and to know that they were safe and well on the other side. He never charged a fee for anyone who wished to listen, 
and he encouraged beleaguered parents who had lost children to join in in hopes that they may establish contact. The walls are littered with pictures of dead loved ones. Parents clearly recognize the voices as belonging to their departed children. My life is a new life. I always talk about my first life. And then it stopped when he died. And then it started when I heard him. Very different. The following audio comes from a session with Marcello Bacci and a group called the Skull Group. The Skull Group experimented with life after death communications in the UK from 1993 to 1998. We would like to ask the question of the appearance of your space. I can't really answer that. Can you tell something about Skull? Thank you. Will the work progress? Certainly. In one experiment, Doctor of Engineering Carlos Trajina set up a second radio besides Bachi's. He had it tuned to the same shortwave frequencies. Even so, Bachi's radio was the only one that received the anomalous transmissions. One experimenter put the radio inside a radio signal-proof casing to ensure Bachi was not transmitting the signals from another location. Again, the voices continued to speak through Bachi's radio. Mario Salvatore Festa, professor of physical and medical radio protection, and radio technician Franco Santi, came to witness Marcello's amazing ability for themselves. They visited Bachi in his laboratory in Grosseto, Italy. They were attempting to understand the origin of the transmission, as well as root out whether Marcello could be a hoax. After examining his radios, they found nothing out of the ordinary. During a session where Bocci was receiving anomalous voices, Franco Santi removed two valves from the radio responsible for receiving normal AM and FM broadcasts. Even without the valves, the voices continued to pour from the speakers. <laughs> Without Marcello present, the radios never picked up anything but normal transmissions. And depending on whether you are a believer or a skeptic, that could mean two different things. To the skeptic, they would say that this is evidence that Marcello is a huckster, using sleight of hand to deceive those who wish to believe. To the believer, however, it proves that Marcello has mediumistic abilities and serves as a conduit through which spirits are able to bridge the two worlds. Regardless, it should be noted that no concrete evidence of Bocci faking his communications has ever been discovered. Like Bocci, Annabella Cardoso is also a practitioner of direct radio voice experimentation. She began experimenting with the phenomenon to help a friend in crisis, but through this process, uncovered something she never thought possible. Annabella was a career diplomat before she became one of the leading forces in the modern ITC community. Her journey started when a friend, who had recently lost his son, introduced Annabella to his grieving wife. And um, I learned about ITC through a, a series of occurrences. Friend who had lost her only son in a sailing accident. She had tried to commit suicide three or four times. It was her only son also. And I was living a period of bereavement uh, too. So we started trying to find out what we could do to attempt any contact, if that, um, if that um, will be possible. And that's when we contacted a Jesuit priest, very interested in the paranormal, although neither of us is, uh, is a Roman Catholic at all. But anyway, he was quite a remarkable person here in figure here in Spain where I was posted as Consul General of Portugal. 
And so we tried to contact him. He was very pleasant and very kind. And um, we went to Madrid to meet uh, this priest who, who was uh, quite famous. We had a very pleasant uh, lunch in a good restaurant in Madrid. And at the end of it, I asked him, what, what do you think we could do? And he said, to reach this goal. And he said, well, the way I see it, I think it would be true ITC. At this time, we already knew about the voice phenomenon. And, um, and that's when we started with the, with the um, EVP, let's call it that way, experiments. Because they were EVP experiments at the very beginning. Their experimentation began in October of 1997. With the assistance of Annabella's friend, Carlos Fernandez, who studied electronics at the National Technological University of Buenos Aires. He helped bring technical expertise, even though he was initially skeptical about what results the experiments would produce. Although Carlos is not interested in the transcendental point of view, let's call it that way, but he's only interested in the technical side of the phenomena. They used a radio tuned to the Jurgensen frequency to generate noise. And for two and a half weeks, they meticulously combed through tape recordings, looking for some evidence. That evidence came on January 17th, when they noticed the first EVP voice imprinted on their tape. From then on, the voices became much more frequent. But it wasn't until the 11th of March, 1998, that something truly unexpected happened. I was here in my house, this house, a little room, it's a big house, and I put aside a little room for my, as our studio in, at that time. And I was doing an EVP experimentation on my own, and the voice started um, replying to me, directly from the loudspeaker of the, of the radio. And that's what happened. And from then on, the voices never stopped. Here is a recording of Annabella's first direct radio voice. You will hear Annabella first ask a question, and then... Pergunto agora o seguinte. Estão, estou... Estamos efetivamente comunicando com o grupo Landel e com Carlos de Almeida. Estamos comunicando com o grupo Landel e com Carlos de Almeida. Pergunto. Annabella says the voice is speaking Portuguese and has translated it as saying, We are listening to everything. We want to know about the world. We want to hear your things. Now we are going to count on you to offer what is just. I was not the one who spoke, but I suppose you made a question. This is very, very difficult. Another world. Annabella's contacts became so frequent and detailed that she was even able to identify repeat communicators, such as a spirit named Carlos de Almada, who Annabella says contacted her from a location called Rio de Tempo, or the River of Time. This Rio de Tempo is where those on the other side are attempting to establish contact with us, just as she is attempting to establish contact with them. 
Their message revolves around the expansion of consciousness, detaching identity from one's physical body, and realizing that every living being on Earth has consciousness and value that extends beyond the physicality. Annabella stresses that her experiments are not conducted with the sole purpose of producing tangible evidence of the existence of life after death. In fact, she recommends anyone else interested in attempting to record direct radio voices not continue, if that is your singular goal. She writes, Contacts with the next world should preferably be attempted not only with the aim of obtaining evidence for survival, although this is a very laudable reason, but with the purpose of expanding one's consciousness as a result. Since Annabella has started experimenting with direct radio voice communication, she has recorded hundreds of encounters over the past decades. We, we are so pleased that you're speaking. To you. Olha, eu não posso responder diretamente. Desculpe. Não posso. Sinto ouvir. Sim? She has an entire room dedicated to capturing these communications in her home. Old valve radios sit on display, similar to what Marcello Bacci once used in his own work. But these old radios have long stopped working. Now, Annabella relies on more modern shortwave radios. Her contacts have become less frequent these days, but she still turns on her radios every day in case a message should come through. What is it Annabella, Marcello Bacci, and others like them have experienced? Is it purely the human mind playing tricks on itself, hearing phantom words and phrases that never existed? Could they be stray radio signals? Or is it possible that there really is another world attempting to contact our own, whose communications spill into ours? Do you think it's possible to communicate with the spirit world? Let us know on our Twitter and Instagram at strange underscore phenom and on Facebook at strange phenomenon, all one word. Please give us a review and subscribe on your favorite podcasting app. Visit www.strange-phenomenon.com for a full list of sources and more episodes. Strange Phenomenon is hosted by Ray Terrara. It's written and produced by RJ Blake and Ray Terrara. Theme music by Tara Monk. A special thanks to Diana Deutsch and Annabella Cardoso for sharing their insights and experiences with us. Learn more about Diana's work on her website at deutsch.ucsd.edu and Annabella's work on her website, itcjournal.org. Additional music provided by Sergei Cheremizinov, LG17, Kevin MacLeod, and Maiden. Links to the artist's websites are available in the show notes. Audio samples of Raymond Cass taken from The Ghost Orchid, an introduction to EVP by Ash International. Audio samples of Bocce's recordings taken from UFO TV's documentary, The Afterlife Investigations. EVP samples taken from Rowdy's Breakthrough and Frederick Jurgensen's from the Studio for Audioscopic Research. <laughs>